Hello, and welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Hope you're all safe and well in this difficult time. Today we're going to actually start in with our lecture content for real and talk today about sound, uh, which is sort of at the heart of things. There won't be much computing in this lecture, but there will be a whole bunch of stuff that's very much what you'll need to know to start dealing with the computers aspect of computer sound and music. So let's just dive into that material. Uh, so sound, first and foremost, is pressure waves. Typically sound in air is pressure waves. So what is a pressure wave? Well, we have this nice visualization here of a spherical pressure wave which you can see sort of as the thing in the center goes in and out. There's sections where the air molecules notionally are closer together, sections where they're farther apart. And those differences in pressure are what your ear registers as a sound. Uh, you can obviously have sound in things that's not air. Uh, water is a thing that sound is studied in a lot. We won't pay it much attention directly in here. Any medium really has some frequency of sound waves that can travel in it. If you take solid state physics, you learn about phonons, which are sort of notional particles of sound. Um, the important thing about a sound wave is that it varies regularly. It's a cyclic phenomenon, so you can sort of see in this visualization, the pressure, you know, sort of sweeps out from the center. And so if you're standing at any particular spot in this field, you'll see the pressure get higher, lower, higher, lower at a regular rate. And that cyclic behavior is at the heart of what sound is. Uh, and there's an interesting relationship here that's absolutely core to everything we're gonna do, which is the relationship between sort of the frequency of the sound wave and the speed that it travels through the medium. So if, again, if you look at this visualization, if I'm standing here, you can sort of see that the waves propagated out slowly. And so the actual wavelengths are fairly long. The distance between one peak and the next is, you know, whatever it is, a couple inches on this screen. And, uh, and the time is, you know, like a second for it to go that distance. And so we get this nice relationship between the two, which is that the uh, speed is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. And so they, they form a constant product. And as I said before, speed of sound in air is around a thousand feet a second, really like 1150 at standard temperature and pressure, but who's counting? And so you can see that as you know, so we measure frequency, like I said, in sort of cycles per second. How many peaks do you see in a second? We measure the speed of sound in feet per second because we're Merkins. Um, we measure the wavelength in feet, again, you know, freedom units, yay. And so what we're gonna find out is that for a 60 hertz sound, right? Well, we get 60 hertz uh, divided by the speed here, and we end up with like 17 feet of between the peaks at one kilohertz, a uh, thousand cycles per second. So a hertz is a cycle per second. And at 1000 cycles per second, we have a wave that's about one foot long. And at 15 kilohertz, then we get a wave that's about an inch long. And uh, so what's the significance then be of these numbers? Well, 60 hertz is a very, very low tone. It's sort of near the bottom of the range of tones you can actually hear. It's a bass note. And 15 kilohertz is sort of the upper limit of human hearing for most of you when you're younger, as your hearing rolls off at about, I forget, a kilohertz, two kilohertz per decade. I think something like a kilohertz per decade, but uh, on average. But um, some people can hear 15 kilohertz. Anything about higher than that is usually regarded as sort of ultrasound or at least near ultrasound. So very high frequencies, very short wavelengths. Uh, kilohertz, which is sort of a normal tone. It's a tone we use a lot in audio because it, you know, in computer audio because it's a nice convenient round number, a thousand. 
is a foot long wave uh, a 60 hertz wave a bass wave is 17 feet long that's long that's really long so if your room is less than 17 feet on a side um, and in particular the ceilings are never 17 feet tall almost then you're gonna get weird effects as that wave that wants to be 17 feet long tries to fit into a room that's too short for it now it's reasonable at this point to actually find out what these sound waves at various frequencies sound like for that i'm going to use a tool called socks which is a unix tool uh that i don't know that it works on windows i'm pretty sure it works on a mac that is sort of a very general purpose command line tool for producing and processing sounds we'll talk about it more later in the course but uh, for this example, I'm just going to use it to generate some sine waves. So let's hear what a one kilohertz tone sounds like. Here's five seconds of that. So it has a very distinctive sound to it and is something that you've heard before. It's kind of a high pitched sound. And like I've said other places, it's sort of a standard tone to use in computer stuff because it's a nice round number and not really for any better reason. Here's what a 15 kilohertz sound sounds like. You can still hear it, but it's very, very, very high pitched. And here's what a 60 hertz bass note sounds like. And that one is not gonna sound as loud because we don't hear low frequencies very well. But looking at the sort of sound level meter that's with my recording software, all three of those were at the same volume. And that gives you an idea of sort of the range from high to low of human hearing and sound. So that's how that all works. And that'll be something to keep in mind. Um, when we talk about waves in this course, we're almost always, unless I say otherwise, going to be talking about sine waves. A sinusoidal wave is one where uh, the, the wave goes like the sine function. So when you uh, watch it vary over time, it varies like the sine of x. If I um, get out the new plot, um, I can say plot um, sine of x and you see this nice i mean i'll make it bigger but you see this nice uh smooth spirally shape that's the what the sine function does that's sort of the fundamental pressure profile we expect to see for sound waves and we'll see as we go through this course a bunch of ways in which that notion of a sine wave plays a fundamental role in what we're doing uh notice that it's the difference in pressure that matters the it doesn't really matter within reason whether you're at 10,000 feet where the air pressure is a little lower whether you're at sea level where the air pressure is a little higher it all works out the same because really what you're measuring is pressure differences so the other thing I wanted to talk about with sound is sort of volume and power and I want to get a first cut at this because it's a complicated topic and there's a lot to say about it. It's sort of the simplest thing you might want to talk about is how loud is this sound? Well, loud is a weird concept and we're going to have to wade through a lot of layers to sort of understand what, how loudness works. But really simply, we might start out with the amplitude of these sine waves. So the amplitude is usually given as either a peak to peak amplitude. I'm sorry, I did this now. I want to plot it again. Uh, peak to peak amplitude here means that you know here's here's a peak above here's a peak below and so we can sort of say that the amplitude the peak to peak amplitude is the difference between this low point and this high point and so if I wanted to make the sine wave big notionally bigger I could you know increase the amplitude and now if I take twice the sine function it ranges between minus two to two so it has an a peak amplitude now of, peak to peak amplitude now of four and that is a perfectly reasonable way to measure the amplitude of a sine wave. But 
it turns out that it's a little misleading when you apply it to things, especially when you apply it to things that aren't sine waves, because what really matters in terms of power is actually sort of not just how high it goes, but how long it's at that height. We sort of notionally think about the power sometimes as the area under this sort of notional curve. And also power kind of goes like the square. And so another common way to sort of measure power is to take the root mean square amplitude. That is, we take the sort of area under the curve of the cycle, we take the square of that, and we then take the square root at the end. And so there's a calculation you can do to sort of understand the relationship between RMS and peak to peak amplitude. So here, if you sort of in our now lost uh, window here, if you think of uh, sort of drawing a line here at zero and then taking uh, sort of the square of each point above or below the line, which obviously for a continuous thing like this is gonna be calculus, then you end up with a signal that's gonna look like, you know, gonna have peaks going up the whole way. And then you sort of sum all those up, which again is integrating in calculus terms, and you take the square root of that, and out comes the sort of root mean square power. So we take the root, we take the average, we take the square. So let's take a little bit at what that calculation, of a look at what that calculation looks like. So, um, and by the way, yeah, calculus. Everybody's like, oh, why do I have to do calculus? It's a computer science course. Well, because calculus describes an awful lot of things that's going on. And here it's gonna describe this sort of better measure for a lot of purposes of, of power or amplitude. So how does this go? Well, we're gonna integrate over one cycle of our sine wave. We're gonna have some peak to peak amplitude multiplying the sine wave. We're gonna take the square of that, integrate, and then divide because it's an average over that period, the zero to two pi period. And then we're gonna take the square root of the whole mess. So this is sort of the definitional version of the root mean square power, but it's not very convenient to work with. You don't really wanna be writing integrals down all the time. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through some fancy mathematics to get rid of most of that. So the first thing we're gonna do is notice that we can move the peak power clear outside because that's how, um, you know, the square of the peak power, right? This is gonna be the square of the peak power times the square of sine of t, and the constants move over the integral sign, and then they can move outside the square root by being square rooted, and out that comes. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and use a double angle transform. This is There's a lot of ways to do this integral. You could do it using the chain rule, but I think it's a lot easier to just do it by going ahead and um, transforming it to something that doesn't need the chain rule. So here I'm going to replace sine squared of t with my one, one half, one minus cos sine squared of t, two t, which is an absolutely legitimate algebraic transformation. And Having done that, I can move some more stuff outside the integral sign. I can actually evaluate the integral, right? The integral of one is t. The integral of this is, again, by the chain rule, one half the sine of two t. And then I'm gonna evaluate that at t equals zero, two pi, subtract that from t at zero. And so for this first term, I get two pi uh, minus zero, so great. Now, an interesting thing happens with the second term, which is that the sine of two pi or any multiple of two pi, right, is zero. So at two pi, this is the sine of four pi, which is zero. At zero, this is the sine of zero, which is zero. So this term just disappears and we're just left with the two pi term. And so now we go through and sort of do all the math and square everything up. We've got a two pi over a half here, which is a pi. So you end up with pi over two pi. So you end up with one over the square root of two. So it turns out that for a sine wave, the root mean square power is just the peak power divided by the square root of two. So there we are. We have a nice explanation for what root mean square power is that allows us to just use a constant that we throw around instead of doing calculation. That's fantastic. So the amplitude in RMS and the amplitude peak to peak uh, are 
given by this relationship. And you ask, well, why root mean square? Why do we want to do this? Well, because it turns out that the power delivered by a signal is proportional to the root mean square amplitude of that signal. And for sound, it is the, they're the same thing, essentially. <laughs> There's no sort of combining factor. And so we often want to work with the RMS power because it's a more accurate measure of how power is delivered. Uh, the Another example that's unrelated to sound, in the United States, we say we have 110 volt line power. That's what's coming out of your plug-in. Well, it turns out that the power coming out of your plug-in is actually very much a sine wave at 60 hertz, at 60 cycles per second. And it turns out that the voltage, that 110 volts, there again, because we're talking about how much power will be delivered, the power is equal to the current times the RMS voltage. And so we actually, when we say 110 volts, we mean 110 volts RMS. That means that the peak amplitude of the voltage coming out of your wall outlet is much bigger. It's actually about 170 volts, not 110. And as a person who does electronics sometimes, you know, when you're sizing components to make sure they don't break down at too high a voltage, it's an important thing to keep in mind that you better have components that'll do 200 volts, not just 150 volts, because 150 volts isn't enough to handle the voltage coming out of your wall socket. So yeah, um, that's peak power and RMS power. Let's talk a little bit, there's a little bit more about sound power on the Wikipedia page, and some of that is worth actually taking a look at. Um, the, there's about a billion units for sound power, and in this course we're not going to spend a lot of time grubbing around with all the different unit systems that are used, but we will touch on a few of them from time to time. The obvious unit to use is the same unit of power you use for anything else. Uh, the watt and you use watts in the sense that there's some amount of watts of energy that's hitting a surface if the sound hits that surface and um, so that's a perfectly reasonable measure um, and unfortunately a watt of sound is a lot of sound uh, if it's delivered to you know the whole room, then it's then it's cut down a lot by inverse square stuff, and so what we typically do is decibels relative to one picowatt. So what's a decibel? Well, decibels are a log scale, so we're going to actually take the log base ten of the power in picowatts, and that's going to give us some decibel number and um. The um, that tells us something about the absolute power that's put out. The other thing is how loud do you hear the sound? And it turns out those things aren't linear. It isn't like a sound of of a hundred decibels sounds you know ten times as loud as a sound of ninety decibels to you, but um, or of eighty decibels rather to you. So there's that. Um, and so it gets very complicated. Um, you know, the the range, because we're using a log scale, then sort of, you know, the zero is sort of the reference value. That's a picowatt um, delivered onto a surface. Human breath is 10 decibels, so it's, um, you know, 10 times as loud. Um, you know, and this table is really nice. It sort of gives you some reference. Uh, a vacuum cleaner is at 70 decibels, a, a, a chainsaw is at 110, and so forth. And that's at a distance of about uh, one foot. And uh, that's, that's sound power. So we're going to be paying attention to that some. The other characteristic that you probably want to think about when you think about sound is what's called latency. And that's sort of, for a sound, how long is it between the time I make the sound and the time that it is heard? So if I clap my hands here, then um, the that clap will go travel over to the microphone, which you can't see off screen here, 
and that'll take some time that's a latency then the signal in the microphone will be put into will be coded into a uh, digital signal and that'll be brought into the computer we'll talk about that in a future lecture and that'll take some time and then the computer is going to actually have to figure out how to get that signal processed which will take some time and then it will write that process signal onto a disk onto my disk to be because we're recording and that'll take some time and so we have a latency we have a time between the time i made that clap and the time that that clap makes it onto the disk and in general an audio latency is our enemy we generally don't want to have signals be late for a whole bunch of reasons that we'll talk about as we go but a certain amount of latency is sort of inherent in everything you do with sound and it's not that it's always bad to have latency so if you've ever heard a reverb what a reverb is is essentially a delay line it takes a signal and deliberately delays it adds some latency to the signal it turns out mixed back in that sort of ec reverberating echoey effect is a really nice effect that works partly because it simulates what happens in the real world where things echo off each other all the time um notice that for audio there's a funny thing there's sort of an analog of heisenberg's theorem for uh audio that says you sort of can't know exactly what frequency and what time a signal is at the same time as signals get low frequency remember our 16 our 60 hertz signal was a 17 foot long wave and so it's really hard to tell exactly when it starts if you hear some some uh, signal start at 60 hertz well it's going to rise up you know very slowly uh, as it propagates and that's going to mean that it's much harder to tell when it begins and so uh it's hard to notice latency in such a sound the other really really important sound idea and this is the last sound idea that we have to cover in this lecture is the idea that you know i keep talking about these waves but obviously there's things floating around in the air that aren't just sine waves so if you remember what those sine waves we played earlier sound like obviously there's a lot of sounds that don't sound like them everything from our voice to everything else and the key idea here is that we can still think of all the sounds that we hear as repetitive sounds we hear, tones that we hear, as combinations of these sine waves. So what I really want to communicate here is that a really, really important idea is that, you know, sort of all those pressures changes that we see sort of add up. If I take a sine wave at one frequency and play it on a, you know, speaker and then I play another speaker with a sound wave of a different frequency the air between them is going to be pressurized sort of as the sum of the amplitudes at any given point right as as one signal goes up and down well it's sort of the sum of those two that i hear is the thing and so superposition is a big deal and we're going to have to think of sound not just as waves but as a bunch of waves added together at any given point uh and that's the fundamental idea behind something called the fourier series the Fourier series is our way of talking about uh, the fact that when you add up uh, any cyclic signal can be represented as the sum of a bunch of sine waves. And so that's a really, really important idea. Um, the, the idea here is that um, if I take any repeating signal i can represent it as the sum of a whole bunch of sine waves and each sine wave has its own amplitude each sine wave has its own frequency here the frequency is in radians which means that to get freedom units to get hertz you're going to have to multiply by two pi and there's also a phase right um does the sound wave start at zero or whatever and those relative phases matter when you have more than one sine wave in play and so the point is any signal can be represented like that and um that's a fundamental idea this idea that sounds add and we'll use it over and over and over again in this course to talk about what's going on 
So that's some of the basics of sound. That's some of what you need to know to actually start playing with sound is sort of what it is and how it works. In the next lecture, I will go ahead and talk about the hearing aspect because sound doesn't, pun intended, exist in a vacuum. It sort of has to be heard. If that tree falls in the forest and you don't hear it, who cares? Um, but we will need to understand then some things about how hearing works and how that affects what we're doing. So I will see you then. And until then, stay safe out there.